playing with your food. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid stand mixer and attachments. you're about to spend your evening with. I'm Angela Clutton. I'm one of the co-directors of Food Season, working with Mr. Thompson, who's the other co-director, and Polly Russell, who is somewhere in the audience, can't quite see. Hey, Polly! Huh? Uh, who is a Food Season founder and curator. Um, season generously supported by KitchenAid, who you've just seen. Um, this is the fifth year, I think, of the Food Season. Uh, we strive every year to put together a real eclectic mix of events, and we are absolutely delighted tonight to be delving into the delicious world of chocolate. Um, we have plenty of chocolate at the end, so that's something to look forward to as you go along um, as we delve into the issues and the social impacts, sustainability, all things to do with chocolate. Um, we have one of our panellists joining us on Zoom, which is quite exciting, um, and I will let Layla introduce the panel. But just to introduce Leila Kazim for anyone who isn't familiar, although any of you who listen to the BBC Food Programme will certainly know Leila as being part of the core team. Uh, also judge of the BBC Food and Farming Awards, co-creator of Lonely Planet book, The Ultimate Eat List, um, and does so much work across all kinds of online and print publications. We could not be in safer hands. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful time. Stick around for chocolate at the end, which has just been the foyer. Leila, over to you. Thank you, Angela. I don't think I've ever had such a wonderful introduction. I'm absolutely flattered. Um, good evening, everybody. How is everyone doing? Are you all excited about the fact we're going to be talking about one of the world's greatest food products over the next 90 minutes? Good. Uh, my name is Leila Kazim. Welcome to Beyond the Bar, the Chocolate Revolution. Um, I think it's great that we're going to be discussing chocolate today because who doesn't want to chat about chocolate and it's an honor to be joined by three chocolate connoisseurs allow me to introduce you to angus thirlwell of hotel chocolat we've got Chantelle cody founder of the chocolate detective and rococo chocolate and via the wonders of the internet we have nick davis chocolate uh, producer and grower, and I don't know whether I should look here, or I should look here, but I'm kind of like, hi Nick, great to have you with us as well. <laughs> um, and also I think it's quite fitting that, we, that tonight's event is actually just a week before Easter, one of the peak chocolate buying and consuming points of the year. Not that chocolate is only for Easter, of course, chocolate is for every day of the year. But I was wondering, show of hands, who has already bought their Easter eggs in time for Easter? I would expect people turning up to this event to be well planned with their <coughs> chocolate purchasing. There's quite a few hands here. I actually haven't. Uh, it's on my to-do list. But today's event, we are going to be discussing chocolate, but specifically the dynamics around producing ethical and delicious chocolate. And the format of the session is such that towards the end, I will be taking questions from both the audience here and also those online. So do think up some tasty chocolate related questions as you are enjoying the uh, discussion. And a little shout out to those online. Thanks for joining in. Um, I've been told to remind everybody here not to forget to pick up your chocolate samples at the end. <laughs> and I feel like we are only going to require one reminder for that. <laughs> uh, so I don't need to mention that again. For those online, I can only apologise that you do not have access to these samples because there are quite a few of them and they do look good. But hopefully you've been able to... Uh, get your hands on some ethical chocolate and you can enjoy it as you are enjoying the discussion today. Panel, oh, panel, good evening. Good How evening. How wonderful to have you all. Um, chocolate, I mean, what a great topic. If we think about the cacao plant, so this is a plant that uh, is native to South and Central America. It's been in cultivation for about 3,000 years. It's 
grown in a tropical band that wraps itself around the globe. And you know, if we think about the cocoa that has, that's produced from this plant, it's been on quite a journey. It started as an ancient spiced cocoa drink of South America. And today we can find the mass produced bars that we're most likely to see in the shops. So I thought what we could do to begin, and Nick, I thought you, Nick, I thought you would be best placed to um, answer this first question, is if you could give us uh, a, an overview of the process of transforming <coughs> cacao pods into chocolate when done on a sort of small scale with traditional methods and how that process differs to the process used to make most of the mass produced chocolate we see in the shops today. Okay, it's, it's a very lengthy process, uh, if we're being truthful. So, um, fortunately, I have a pod, or at least one which oh. we can use, close to hand. Okay, so cool. this is how it starts its life. This is a cacao pod. It's the fruit of uh, uh, Theobroma cacao tree, cacao tree, chocolate tree. It sort of grows off the main limbs of the actual tree. Okay, we would use like a, a well, here in Jamaica, we use like long poles, depending on how well the trees are pruned, uh, to pull those pods off the tree, almost like a, a, a hook to just pull them away from the actual main body of the tree. When they fall, uh, we would break them open. We'd use like either a rubber mallet or we would use a machete to break open the pods. Machete not so good because you can damage the precious beans which are inside. So inside you've got the, well, outside, let's start with that. You've got the outer protective shell of the house. And then you've got the fruit body, which is one of my favorite words in the English language, the baba, which is like 30 to 50 beans, which is surrounded by a white pulp. That white pulp is the fruit, which if you've never had the chance to taste, I can assure you is one of the greatest things on earth, not commonly eaten, wow. okay? It's just, and, and yeah, it's really the key to that. It's, it's, it's literally the key to everything because without that fruit, we wouldn't be able to get the fermentation which transforms this seed into what we know as chocolate. Mm -hmm. So we then, and this has been done for thousands upon years, years, we then get these individual beans, we break them apart, we pull the, the sort of main pith or placenta away from the actual beans, put them into big containers. And once they're in those bigger containers, we'll put either banana leaf or uh, other things on top to be able to start that fermentation process. The sugars from the actual uh, seeds, or at least surrounding them, will start to ferment and it will change over a number of days. As we stir that, it's going to introduce oxygen. That's going to almost like turbo boost the fermentation at various points. That's what we need. That's the key element. And by varying how we ferment, we can really change the flavors of the finished products. Even, you know, outside of like the genetics of the individual trees, we'll talk about that later on, but we can do a lot to change the ultimate flavor. We then get those beans, dry them for about five days, uh, lay them out, um, different ways of doing it. Some parts of the world it's laid out literally on, on the ground. Uh, here in Jamaica, it's on raised platforms and we dry it for about five days. How we dry it again can have a huge impact on the, the final flavor of the actual chocolate, of the cocoa. Uh, once it's dried, we'd leave it to age, and then we'd get the beans. When we have those beans, we'll then break them down, we'll process them. What we do here in Jamaica, and you, you spoke later about the traditional methods. The traditional methods are, are ones which are very, here in the Caribbean, not too dissimilar from the techniques of spice drink, which you were talking about from Central and South America. So what we would do is we would get a, a mortar and mortar stick uh, I love how we say things in the Caribbean. So pestle and mortar, okay? We'd use, um, we'd use something like a tropical hardwood like guango and you'd very roughly hew it out and then literally beat it until you are breaking down those beans into constituent parts, releasing the cocoa butter, which is natural within the bean, turning it into uh, almost like a rough, grainy, sort of like a Mexican style chocolate. Here in the Caribbean, here in Jamaica, we would add cinnamon, nutmeg, uh, bay into it as a prime example, ginger, to be able to eventually turn that into a hot beverage. And that's how I grew up knowing chocolate until the Milky Bar kid, and then everything changed. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so how does this process differ if we're looking at chocolate produced on a mass, 
on a mass scale. Is it quite similar, just scaled up, or is it actually quite a different journey? All of that process going up to the mortar and mortar stick, okay? So it hasn't changed. You know, it's still an incredibly labor-intensive product to get it from the, literally from the tree to the bar. But once you get to the point where you are starting to refine it, when you're starting to turn it into cocoa products, that's where you see the shift. So even bean to bar, which is what I do, is still relatively primitive in terms of what you're doing. You're using a grinder to be able to mash and break the beans down into that liquid form. Whereas once you get to a more industrial stage, you're using bigger machine, free roll refiners, which are creating a paste. You're using, you know, uh, universal conches. You're using machines which cost hundreds and hundreds, millions of dollars to be able to, sorry, you can tell I live in the Americas, right? Uh, to be able to, to transform that into the finished product. Mm. And that's where we, we see a massive change. Mm. It, it, you're talking about something which can be done very cheaply, at a local scale, but to be able to get it to that industrial scale, the amount of research, the amount of knowledge which is which is in there is, you know, it's huge, it's huge. Mm. Chantal, what would you say are the main problems with the way that most chocolate that we find in the shops is produced today? I think the biggest um, challenge is effectively turning the traditional model of growing cocoa beans and trading them as a commodity um, by using e exploiting humans, which could be indentured labor, it could be slaves, it could be children. And um, so turning that upside down and giving back um, to the, the farmers who grow the cocoa and where possible to start producing chocolate right there where it's being grown so that you can actually create a, a proper microeconomy on a small scale near to where the cocoa is being grown and and there are some fantastic examples of that i mean nick is doing that in jamaica um, i've been involved with a little company called grenada chocolate company who were really one of the very very first i believe in the world this century just around um, 2001 2 they started doing it and um, as you know, Nick was talking about these complicated, huge machines, now you can get really tiny tabletop chocolate makers. But um, just 20 years ago, that didn't exist. So the guys in Grenada, who were, one of them was a brilliant engineer, um, Mott Green, he actually he got some antique machines and he built some machines. And he was always keen to try and make things, you know, appropriate technology. Um, but at the same time, produce a really fantastic quality chocolate, which is, is possible, mm -hmm. but it's definitely much, much more difficult because you're making it in the tropics, you've got the humidity, you've got the heat, and, you know, potentially you might need a lot of power. I mean, they had solar panels on the, the roof of the factory, so that mitigated the need to use too much electricity. But, um, I mean, many, many challenges. Mm. You touched there about farmers, so the actual people on the ground growing the cocoa. What 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 um, challenges do they face at the minute? So there's the, there's often a lot of chat about the fact that farmers don't get paid fairly for what it is they're producing. Well, I think um, it's I think it's a global problem, but particularly in places like the Caribbean and Africa, we know that farmers um, that the average age of a farmer is not young, that the young people are not inspired to follow in their footsteps. There's nothing cool about farming. They have a reputation, the farmers are being, you know, wearing clothes that are dirty, carrying around a cutlass, and somehow that image, um, you know, the younger generation would rather have some nice trainers and tracksuit on. So. I think here we, we've had, particularly in the pandemic, people you know, growing stuff in their window boxes. We, we have a, a slightly rarefied view of what farming and gardening mm. is. Obviously, in a tropical climate, it's incredibly arduous. You know, you, you've got high temperatures, humidity. Um, some, some of the cocoa is grown on very steep slopes. So it's a, and it's just a huge amount of work. You, you've got this um, fertile ground where lots of... Um, 
climbing sort of weeds. Yeah, you have to keep all that under control. And, you know, some, some farmers use inputs, chemical um, fertilizers and insecticides, obviously, from our point of view, we, we're very keen on organic farming. But so there's, it's kind of wide. Mm. It, it's a bit as many different types of farming in cocoa as there are in other types of farming around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nick touched on, or Chantal, I think it was you that just touched on it, child labour. I don't know if anybody saw um, the Dispatches episode, Channel 4, last week called, what was it called? Uh, Cadbury Exposed. Put your hand up if you did manage to watch that. Yeah, if you didn't, it's worth it's worth catching up. But it was I thought it was quite timely for this event. But it basically showed that illegal child labour is being used to supply cocoa beans to Cadbury, Britain's favourite chocolate brand. And the dispatches team were undercovering Ghana, where children as young as ten have been working gruelling hours to supply cocoa beans to Cadbury. So children as young as 10 working in the sort of conditions, you know, the hot, the heat and the humidity. Um, Angus, I wanted to get your thoughts on child labour. I mean, how much of a problem is it? How prevalent is it in the industry today? <clears throat> well, I think um, the fact that it's, it's still present is, is, is a bit of a stain, a, a big stain on the chocolate industry. And it has been for way too long. And the central problem isn't that Ghanaians don't love their children. I can tell you categorically they love their children as much as British people do, if not more. Um, the problem is poverty. And when people become desperate, and literally it's about how we're going to, um, you know, how we're going to earn enough money to feed ourselves, then um, it can be a choice between either my children go to school or they help get this crop in, which we can turn into cash, and then we can buy food and we can survive. So nobody wants to have to make that choice, but that's the invidious position that is brought about by poverty. So the, 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 the simple answer is to pay more for cocoa. And you might wonder why that hasn't happened. And, and, the, and, the, and the central problem is the disconnection between the agricultural side that we've started talking about and the the luxury side where the markets are so although cocoa grows around the equator all the developed markets are in in you know the northern hemisphere typically and it's it's been quite easy for long established chocolate brands to to kind of have a veil hiding the, the these two worlds and for this problem to be blamed on farmers' low productivity. If only they could grow more cocoa, then they would earn more. But actually, the farmers can't grow more because um, growing more will um, deplete their land and they're growing as much as nature's giving back to them. So the, 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 the problem is, um, is about the amount that is being paid for the cocoa. And... Um, if, if, if that is put right, then child slavery will be reduced to a very low level. I can't say it will ever be reduced in the same way as domestic violence will never disappear or things like that. But at least the, the understandable reasons for it um, uh, you know, will, will, will be taken away. So that's, that's the kind of simple analysis. Mm. And it is possible to put it right um, just just by paying more and you know we know in our business that there is enough profit in the chocolate industry to to pay more to cocoa growers and not kill your business and that's kind of exactly what we've been progressively trying to do at Herta Chocolat. Um, we bought an old cocoa farm not that far away from where where Nick is and where Chantal um, had, had, had you know has her connection with with Grenada in in St Lucia in the Caribbean, so we learned from zero how to how to grow how to grow cocoa and um, educated ourselves on what the issues were. And it was pretty clear immediately that the prevailing price of cocoa meant that you would walk into an immediate loss from being a, a, a farmer of cocoa. So we were lucky because we were selling the beans back to ourselves 
So, so I immediately hiked the price up to the right levels so that our farm didn't make a huge loss. And because we're a direct to consumer business, we were also able to talk to our customers and explain why this chocolate from St. Lucia was more expensive than our other chocolate. And it, we managed to make it work. And from that initial learning, we've gradually been rolling it out and um, in November this year, we launched in Ghana a new program where we're, we're, we're paying a, a, a much higher premium direct into farmers' pockets to, um, to make it right and make it possible to earn a, um, a living income as defined by the UN's measurement of how you should approach um, you know, calculating what a, a, a living income w would be in, in rural Ghana. So we're we've, we've, we're making a you know a lifetime commitment to keep progressively improving this as well, because um, and this is where I think with the dispatches program the fundamental problem lay um, in in kind of promising that you don't need to worry about that we've got it sorted as a brand, and clearly that wasn't the case from the dispatches um, expose, and it really isn't the case ever with um, a, a complex crop like, like cocoa, the, you know, the, it, it, we will always have issues of global warming, we will always have issues of um, sustainability with, with people and with, with, with communities. So to say that it's ever going to be tick done, you don't have to worry about it, is I think the fundamental problem. It's, it needs to be um, energetically focused on by the chocolate industry and there needs to be acceptance that we're you know we have to get better every year mm -hmm. and it's an ongoing challenge for everybody it's a journey yeah yeah a journey and there, there's also the thing about um who are those children because some of them are the children of the farmers some of them are not mm. that that's much more concerning to me when if you're in a country which has borders and Typically, in the cocoa area in West Africa, there's a lot of um, there've been many wars and political problems, and leaky borders, and you know there there it definitely is child trafficking mm -hmm. going across. Those kids are not on anyone's radar. Yeah, they don't have a birth certificate or a passport, and you know how how can you understand what's going on when you've got such complexities? Yeah. Um, I think in in Grenada we can say that kids go to school free up to the age of 14. I have never seen a child um, working on the, the land. They, you know, they might occasionally go on to pick themselves a pod so they can suck the delicious fruit from it, but that's a bit like scrumping an apple. Yeah. Um, so yes, I think it's, it's nuanced and it's very different in different places. Yeah. But I mean, the Grenada thing for me was the, the model of getting a cocoa farmer and showing him it was worth doing something with that cocoa mm. to make it into chocolate rather than just leave it unpicked, which a lot of them were doing because mm. they could earn plenty of money picking nutmeg. They didn't need to bother with the cocoa. I mean, nutmeg's a lot simpler than, yep. than cocoa. Mm, interesting. And, you know, it's a real cash crop. You mm. pick it up from the ground, get a sack full, sell it. That could feed your family for a month. Mm. Sadly, since the hurricane, there, there's not so much nutmeg anymore. But for a long, long time, that was a very good staple earning power for, for farmers. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a bit about um, the solutions that are, are happening to try and address the problems in the chocolate making industry. Nick, you mentioned earlier bean to bar. This is something I, I, I hear sort of banded about, and it's also on the packaging of some chocolate. Can you just explain to us what that means, please? So bean to bar chocolate is um, a relatively, relatively uh, new concept. Um, and it came about because people realized that they could hack chocolate. Um, they realized that you didn't need super expensive machinery. In fact, uh, the person who was really behind the sort of growth of this was a guy called John Nancy. Um, in Eugene, Oregon, who realized that the dosa grinder used within Indian cooking was not a million miles away from the old melanges used by, you know, 
Hershey's back in the day or Cadbury's. And that if you refined down those beads, if you broke them down using those stone wheels uh, and the stone base, you would eventually create a cocoa mass, a liquor. And then you could add sugar to it and then you could create these wonderful chocolates. Now, if you had good beans, you had uh, one of these machines, you could make chocolate. So we've seen a huge explosion. Uh, as Chantal said earlier on, when the Grenada Chocolate Company first started, there were very few bean to bar chocolate makers. Uh, the same thing for Angus as well. There were a few people who were taking chocolate from bean to bar. Now, pretty much anybody with like a countertop and 500 quid can make chocolate. The problem is, is that for me, it's a blessing and a curse. We've kind of democratized chocolate, but now there's so much to choose from, um, but not enough people who want to pay the money for that product that we find ourselves in a slightly different, difficult situation. So beans bar chocolate is really taking the beans from, you know, the, the, the unroasted beans, roasting them, turning them into a liquor, adding sugar, and hopefully creating great chocolates. That's what we mean by beans bar in its truest form. So this doesn't necessarily, this, is, this isn't a process that necessarily has to happen at source where the beans are grown. It could be anywhere, people importing the raw seeds and then, and then producing the chocolate. And actually that's actually, this is going to be controversial, that's actually one of the biggest problems. Because in many respects, bean to bar in country has huge impact because you are adding value in that country. But as you know, chocolate does not travel well. Okay, so, you know, it's not the easiest thing to get from here in Jamaica over to where you guys are. And so there are so many issues in regards to being able to do that, that it makes it difficult. But if we're talking about a really good way to be able to really make changes, it is about being able to create in countries of origin, being able to add value. And by doing that, you're also empowering those same kids, as Chantal said, who don't want to be farmers. You know, they don't see any value in it. I, I always say, if you ask a kid in rural Jamaica, would you prefer to be struggling with internet or struggling without internet? They'd always say with internet. So you're not gonna get that in rural Jamaica. So people move into the cities where they have, where they believe that there's more opportunities. There's very little money which exists within Coco. Here, even here in Jamaica, I'll give everybody a really brief example. When you buy the wet beans, as I said, which we transform, into cocoa the cost or the price of the price which is paid to farmers here in jamaica middle income developing country is 2300 jamaican dollars per box that's the equivalent of 18 quid to get a box of cocoa you need to break open 600 pods that's four hours wow. work why would anybody do that i mean why do i do that you know but it's because of that that value add right I'm able to do the value add and I'm able to, I'm able to impact. But, you know, for, for the average person, you know, you literally have to be on the edge to even think that that's an, a, a viable way to be able to make a living. Mm, gosh, I can't imagine the, the, how hard that work must be as well in the sort of environment. Um, okay, here is a question, Chantal, I'm gonna ask you. What does ethical chocolate mean? What makes a bar of chocolate ethical? That's a very question. tough question. I mean, for me, it's about connecting right back to the source, to the farmers, to understanding more about um, the conditions that they're working in, how much they're being paid, what their lives are like. Um, because if you don't, you, you know, if you're just going to a shop, you're paying a pound and you're buying a bar of something, you know, deliciously sweet and wonderful, and you rip off the wrapper, eat it, you know, usually the whole lot in one go, throw it away and have no thought about it. I think, I think it's that thing of asking questions, trying to understand really what's going on. And I, I know there's one particular brand at the moment who are um, going on this slave-free ticket but the, the chocolate they produce is pretty much like Cadbury's. And it's being made in a huge factory in Belgium. And now, you know, they're saying they have found children in the mm. chain and that actually that's a good thing because it shows that the scrutiny is working. <laughs> but well, that kind of doesn't it. quite um, cut it with me. Mm. 
But I think I think it's about really trying to to connect and to see, you know, people want to know about where their food's from. I think, you know, Prominent. ask the questions, really try and dig deep and, and get some answers. Mm. And I think the more we can get right back to the, the roots, the better. Angus, do you think ethical washing is a thing? So where companies will claim ethical or green principles, you know, such as on their packaging, but actually behind the scenes, not much is going on and it's all a bit of smoke and mirrors. Is that something consumers need to be aware of? <clears throat> well, hugely. Um, and I mean, you, you see it in all um, walks of life at the moment. I mean, for example, compostable packaging. In, in the UK, it's very difficult to get compostable packaging actually um, composted mm. because the um, waste management stream can't recognize the, re the com potentially compostable packaging. And so it just goes into landfill where I've, I've, I've been made to understand that it lets off more carbon than non-compostable um, packaging. So, mm. you know, once you know that, and you continue to position compostable packaging as a benefit, it's, 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 it becomes greenwashing or eco-washing. Um, and this, the same thing really um, in, in, in the chocolate industry. It's, um, I mean, bean to bar has an advantage in that it's, you know, it's small scale chocolate making, it's introducing the taste of cocoa rich chocolate to, to more people. And that then leads to a, a more reverence for the cocoa bean over just chocolate. And when we can separate the cocoa bean from um, poor quality chocolate, then people are prepared, to, well, are interested and curious to know who the farmer is and what conditions are the beans grown in and you know, to ask naturally curious questions that we might ask about the wine that we drink or the olive oil or, mm. the, or the cheese and, and there's Know, definitely chocolate is heading in the right direction there and there's nothing quite like consumer power to make brands do the right thing because I think in, in today's world um, the consumers that I get to hear from expect the brands that they spend money with to do the right thing wherever they can and they you know there's no excuse to not do the right thing once you have the opportunity you have the resources and you have the knowledge, it's perplexing why you wouldn't do that mm -hmm. for consumers. Mm. It's important for consumers to keep the pressure on their <clears> brands. Yeah, sure. and, the, and the real problem with greenwashing is it does a huge disservice in demotivating well-minded consumers once they find out that it's fraud. Mm. It then turns them off doing anything um, that's beneficial because um, you've kind of blown the credibility of a whole industry or, mm. um, you know, an approach and, and that's incredibly dangerous so mm -hmm. it's uh, you know I'm, yeah I think I think uh, any, anybody in um, responsible brands who are trying to do the right thing really actively detest greenwashing. Mm. Um, um, Nick I wanted to ask you so you touched on this earlier about the I guess the value it, it, this is sort of about restoring the value of chocolate because, you know, cacao is not an easy crop to grow. We've already talked about the very difficult sort of heat and humidity of growing it. Um, chocolate is one of the most miraculous processes in the food world ever. And yet, quite often, we still pay so little for our chocolate. Why is that? Um, well, I'm going to go back to go forward. I think not only do we have greenwashing on, I think we also have ethics washing as well. There's a lot of craft chocolate companies who use, we're working with smallholder farmers to be able to improve their lives to also sell chocolate. And, and, I, and it's not just because I'm a Brit that I'm cynical, right? But I'm very cynical when it comes to some of that sort of thing. And I see it within craft chocolate as well. You know, it's easier to sell a bar if you're saying that you're helping farmers than actually giving, uh, you know, poot. And that's, that's a real issue which I'm, I'm a bit concerned about. I think that there is a, there's still a historical impact which plays a role with everyday commodity production within these countries, which are often um, populated by people who are brown and black. 
Um, and I think that there is still the extraction of the value, which which continues. You know, people have to make a they have to make profit. I understand that. You know, that's the basis of a capitalist system. But you know, there isn't necessarily that same pushback to be able to make sure that it's fair. I think um, it, sometimes it, it it just makes me really sad <laughs> being in these countries because it it's it it seems so unfair and it seems so difficult in terms of how we go to ex how are we going to move past the point which we're in? Um, and I think a lot of the work needs to be done in our in our own countries. The same as what's happening in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the same as what's happening in Ghana to really push to try and see legislation change uh, the money which is paid to farmers because the companies aren't interested. It goes back to what Chantal was saying a second ago. They, they don't really care. Um, and we need to try and figure a way to be able to to empower to empower people to to care. There needs to be an Angus, no disrespect. There needs to be about ten companies of your size producing craft chocolate, you know, at a large scale. You know, twenty, even maybe more. And we're not seeing that yet. You know, we're we're not seeing enough people who are willing to go into their pockets to pay a fair value for craft chocolate. That's mm. what that's what that's what's going to make a difference. And if we don't, and this is I d I don't know if this is even well thought out, Layla, but you know, instead of instead of us having a go at some of these these chocolate companies, why don't we talk to the supermarkets? You know, where is most of the value? Where is most of the profit made in chocolates? It's in, it's at the retailer stage. So we need to be talking to X big retailer and say what are you doing to be able to put that money back in? They, they would probably just step away from it, but you know, maybe that's something which we need to look at. Mm -hmm. Making retailers take more of a more responsibility to make sure that they hold these companies to account. Because ultimately, unless they're buying a product, they're not making the money. Mm. Mm. The other person who makes a lot of money is the exchequer, because there's VAT on every single bar of chocolate. They do absolutely nothing to earn that. They just, um, it comes in as revenue. Mm. So they might even be able to start thinking about interesting ways in which they could encourage better practice. Mm -hmm. It was funny because on this Dispatches episode, there was a, a point where it had a, um, an infographic of a bar of chocolate and the percentage of each bar, what percentage goes to different different parts of the chain and I think the farmer I think it was either six or eleven percent I know one's double the other but it was it was a small amount which I found quite incredible but a, the retailer got a big bit and so on so yeah there are questions I think need to be asked throughout the entire yeah. chain um, I wanted to ask about micro producers so we touched on this Chantal I'm gonna ask you this so the microproducers, and I've got here that they make up just 20% of the market volume value-wise. So these are the people who will import the raw um, beans and then using their 500 pound countertop machine, I might add this to my Christmas list, um, do the whole chocolate making and processing themselves to so sort of taking that away from the big processing giants. Chantel, what effect have these microproducers had on the chocolate making industry? Well, I'm not sure, really. Um, I mean, Nick was touching on it earlier, saying what it's done is it, it means there's a lot of craft chocolate out there. Um, so in a way, everyone's competing with each other. Mm -hmm. And if the consumers are still um, struggling with the concept that it's worth paying something more than, you know, a pound or two for a bar of chocolate, um, there's a bit of a tension there. And of course, it, it doesn't guarantee any sort of ethical trail to where they got their beans from. Some of them could be amazing and they could have real relationships with the cocoa growers. But for me, it's just a micro scale of what the big industrial people are doing in a you know, nice cold climate where it's quite easy to control everything. So it's, it's, it's an easy and fun thing to do. And it's, you know, it's a hipster thing to do. Um, and there's another wonderful story about some, some hipsters who got found out f 
for, for their poor practice at the beginning. And they, were, they handled it so badly because they, they were in America at this farmer's market. They were doing their little grinding and making some very good chocolate, apparently. But it sold out so quickly, they couldn't quite keep up. So then they started melting buttons from a, a very good producer. So very good chocolate. And when they were asked, and it wasn't just once, it was repeatedly over the years, they just denied it. They, they, all they needed to say was, look, we're, we're struggling to make the amount, um, and this is a really good chocolate. Or they could have charged mm. double for the one they were actually making <coughs> compared to the one they're just melting down the beans. But that didn't do anyone any favours. It's interesting, it's making me now, because I've always thought, oh, if I am choosing a chocolate from a micro producer that is, is pr priced more than the sort of mass produced stuff that's probably ethical but now I'm understanding that actually it, that doesn't necessarily isn't the case and we, we will touch on what on earth do we as consumers do when we're trying to choose at the checkout in the shop which chocolate to purchase because there seems to be a lot of things to consider. Um, I wanted to so, so far, I'm getting the idea that if a chocolate can be made at source, where the cacao, cacao is grown, that is the best situation for the local economies. But Angus, I wanted to ask you, because I know Hotel Chocolat, they bring the beans to the UK and you make the chocolate here, is that correct? So I wanted to ask, why do you do that? And if you could explain a little bit about what you do in St Lucia as well. Um, well, we do a bit of both, really. So um, most of our beans come from Ghana, and those beans are, are roasted in Ghana and ground up into an intermediate stage, which is called cocoa liquor, um, and then cast into quite kind of rugged blocks and then put into, in, in, into container ships and then sent to the UK for further, um, further refinement. And it kind of works because if, if the chocolate, um, the, the cocoa liquor melts and reforms, um, normally that's a disaster for chocolate because you'd lose the, the snap and, and the careful arrangement of the cocoa butter crystals that, are, that gives you that gloss and, and, and a beautiful snap. But at the cocoa liquor stage, it's quite resilient. And as long as moisture doesn't get in, it can be sea shipped without needing to be um, air conditioned or anything like that, so it's it's a good way of add, leaving you know adding some value in Ghana, but then doing the more complicated um, temperature controlled stuff in a in a cooler climate. Is it just really difficult to make chocolate in these hot, humid places? Um, well, on, on scale, it, it depends. I mean, chocolate covers a wide variety of of, of, of different forms. I mean. Um, we reference 3,000 years that humans and cacao have been kind of, you know, found each other. Of, of, the, of that time, only two, the last 200 years has been mostly about edible chocolate. The preceding time was all about drinkable chocolate. And drinkable chocolate is, is, is much more rich in potential to be made in country and consumed in country or shipped you know, and exported from that country. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that's one thing. Then you have solid chocolate bars that are much more resilient than a a very delicate, you know, ganache or a, or a praline that melts um, and and can be damaged much more easily. And it's typically more added value as well. So hence, if 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 you have a you know a, a fifty pound box of you know Hotel Chocolat's finest, which you know, it would be quite a big box like this. If one of those chocolates gets heat damaged, um, we would typically get a complaint from our customer and have to refund them. So hence, the, you know, the, the control of temperature and humidity and, and careful management all the way through is, is absolutely vital. But um, in St. Lucia, we uh, roast the beans and make them into um, all manner of, 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 of cacao products, including a cacao pulp martini, which um, when uh, we, we saw the cacao pulp being raised up, you can pull that pulp away and put it through a sieve and then put it in a shaker with some vodka and a bit of 
sour sop juice and it's... I mean, could we get some of these with the it's tastings? <laughs> after, um, after this sounds <laughs> like a good I think we ought to. But it, but it really illustrates the point that there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of valuable parts in, in, in this amazing crop that comes from mm. the cocoa tree that can be used in country and um, consumers are, are becoming more curious and adventurous about it. Mm. So I think, it, I think it's a, a, a good dose of creativity is needed mm. and not to kind of fixate on a box of chocolates that's got to be made in, in, a, in a country that's way too hot to, you know, to avoid them all melting. That's really interesting. So sort of considering what other products could be made from the rest of the pod at that, and that, that would work being made in these environments. Yeah. Right. Yes such as the martinis. Yeah. Um, Nick. Hey, look, I, was, I was just going to come in. Yeah. I, I was going to say to you, the actual legal name of my company is Temper Tantrum Limited. It, it's a chocolate in-joke, but that shine and the snap, temper which Angus was temper talking about, when you need to temper chocolate in a tropical environment, it gets you very angry. OK, uh, so Temper Tantrum Limited, if you want to check it out. But no, seriously, it is very hard to do it in country. As Angus knows, uh, as Chantal knows, Electricity in the Caribbean is prohibitively expensive. If you guys are feeling the pinch now, that is like an everyday reality in the Caribbean for the last 50 years, okay? It is so expensive for energy. And again, it's why what Mott and the team at Grenada Chocolate Company did was so ahead of, so ahead of the curve by running the factory off solar. You know, it's something which I'm trying to move desperately towards right now. But we face a lot of challenges, not only with tempering, not only with electricity, not only with, with um, you know, HVAC and AC and all of these things, shipping. It, it's, it's, it's a monumentally difficult thing to do as a business in the Caribbean. But again, I do believe that the only way that we can almost inspire people to get back planting is to be able for them to be able to see value in what we do. Sorry. Well, no, that means you've kind of half answered my question, my next question, which was going to be to you, which was, what are the main challenges? So if someone is, someone is um, you know, li living at source where, close to where the, the, the um, crop is grown and they would like to pursue making chocolate there, what are the main challenges? And why, like, how many people are actually doing that now? How are they able to, and and what is stopping more people from doing it? Because I feel like there's not that many pe people doing that now, and it seems to so, be such an ideal situation for in terms of the local communities. Absolutely. I mean, there's a, a few things, and I apologise if I forget some of them. But number one, everything starts with the beans, as far as I'm concerned. It's it's the quality beans. If you have quality beans, it's really difficult to mess up chocolate. Okay. Well, it's possible. A lot of people do that, to be fair. But you, it's, it's more <laughs> tricky, right? The problem is, is that a lot of the knowledge has been lost over time. So a prime example, I know Jamaica very well. In Jamaica, the only people who were allowed after emancipation, sorry, after independence, sorry, in 62, to be able to process cocoa was in government fermentaries. And that's still a thing which exists in a lot of post-colonial countries. Ghana, as a prime example, the only people who can buy beans are the governments. They controlled the science, they controlled the facilities, and it means that in some places, Ghana again, I believe is a prime example, you have to get a special license to be able to buy beans. You know, uh, so that means that it, the huge barriers to entry, even here in the Caribbean, for me to be able to have a trade license to sell Angus beans, I need to have a farm which would make me one of the largest producers of cacao on the island, right? I'm not a multimillionaire. So there's lots of barriers to entry which have historically been put in place to stop the small person, to stop the smallholder farmer being able to leverage up. So that's one of the problems. But if you get great beans, okay, it's all about the beans. If you get that smallholder equipment, you can make chocolate. And then once you start making chocolate, you improve your technique, you understand more about how cocoa needs to be roasted, you understand more about the process, you understand about conching, how you can use heat to be able to improve the feel and the flavours of what are coming out of the chocolate. All of those things can still be done at a small scale. You can win awards. I've won awards for my chocolate, literally originally starting in this room before I got my bigger facility. But that can all be done in country. It's just significantly more difficult than if you're doing it in the US or Canada or the UK. 
difficult but possible. More than more than <clears> possible. <throat> I, as I said, I, I encourage I encourage people to do this because the more smallholder cocoa producers we have in country, the more incentivized people will be to be able to literally go back to their abandoned ruined farms, which exist right now. Mm. Okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm I'm now switching to consumer mode, and I'm thinking because I, I mean touched on it the the choice seems to be huge and lots of information thrown at us and things to sort of digest when we're trying to uh buy chocolate so what i've done is i've brought in three bars of chocolate from home and what i'm going to do because i see if we all sort of are we thinking along the same lines or not i'm going to just read a little bit of the information on each packet and then i'm going to ask the audience and also the panel if we, if we have a consensus as to which one we think is maybe the most ethical, which one is the least ethical, okay? These are just totally random bars that I have quite a lot of chocolate at home. This is a very small selection of what I've brought in. Okay, first one is called Chocolada. So this is number one, Chocolada. And it says, so this is where beans are shipped across the ocean via wind power, so via sailboat. And also it says, Chocolada is dedicated to the craft of small batch chocolate making from bean to bar, there's that phrase, using only the finest ingredients. And it says, the cocoa beans in this bar are supplied by the Alliance of Rural Communities of Trinidad and Tobago, an organization committed to empowering a vibrant local food economy for the islands. Okay, that's the first one, Chocolada. The second one I brought, is called fire tree this says single estate philippine philippines Min, mindanao island and on the back it says wow it's really hard to read um <laughs> it's got tasting notes mostly tasting notes and then it says our cacao is grown in the lush volcanic hills under a canopy of coconut palms sounds absolutely ideal the farmers divide the skills of harvesting and fermenting, resulting in an exquisite chocolate. That's kind of all the information that that one has. And then I've got Whitaker's New Zealand Artisan Chocolate. This is a flavoured chocolate, it's coffee. At the back it says that they have been making chocolate for generations and they combine the world's finest cocoa with the most delicious ingredients sourced directly from New Zealand's finest artisan producers no other information worth noting so this is number three worth noting none of these have any kind of um certification or stamp there's no fair trade uh, thing on it no um, rainforest alliance no organic okay so show of hands and then i'm, I'm going to ask the audience and i'm going to ask the panel what, what you think show of hands who thinks Question, which one do we think is the most ethical? Show of hands if you think number one, Chocolada, <coughs> is the most ethical of the three based on the information I have given you. Ooh. That's a lot of people. Okay, that's a vast majority. <coughs> number two, Fire Tree. Okay, we've got a handful here. This is the single estate in the Philippines. Number three, Whitakers, New Zealand. We've got one at the front. Okay, so, okay, I think that the point of this exercise is that there is does not consensus based on the information given on the package. And panel, would you, based on this information, you know, you're not gonna go to the website at the point of buying, you're just gonna base it on what you can see. Would you purchase any one of these based on the information on the packets, thinking that it was ethical? And equally, is, are there any that you would avoid based on the information on the packet? Well, you're really putting us um, <laughs> under the, the hot lamp evening, here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I find it really hard to answer this because I actually know um, two of those producers. Right. And I do know they have good practice. Um, the third one, which is a New Zealand one. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like this is quite a well-known brand. Which is yeah. Uh, well, I don't know. I've, I haven't really come across it, but... Um, my question is, do they grow cocoa and coffee there? Because they're talking about local ingredients, which I suspect um, they don't grow them there. 
So that, that makes me a little bit worried. Um, I think the um, Chocolada is very transparent about exactly how they're doing it, where it's coming from. Mm, this did seem to have and the most information. And, and Fire Tree um, are specialising in getting beans, which I know they have grown very carefully supervised communities that, that grow the cocoa. So it's definitely a lot better than the, the normal commodity trading um, thing. And that they're, they're extremely good chocolate makers. That's so interesting because, because I had a hunch based on pure packaging, or to be honest, that maybe these, these were quite ethical, but they hardly they don't, they don't talk tell about, you about it. it. No. So not only are we yeah. maybe faced with mm. ethical washing where people are over talking what yeah. they're doing, we might also be faced with the fact that they're not actually sharing all the good stuff that they're doing. Mm. So my question is, what on earth should we look for as a consumer on a bar of chocolate if we want to try and buy ethical chocolate? We have to go a little bit further than just the wrapper. It's a bit, if you, to be very crude, if you go into a, a shop to buy a bottle of wine, and you could say you've got a choice between red, white, pink, or fizzy, mm. um, that's it. Most people would understand there are huge differences among those categories, and then you've got mass-produced wines, you've got organic wines, you've got natural wines, you've got particular grape varieties, you've got makers. Um, you know, there are so many other bits of information, but still people might well know more about particular producers who bother to communicate their story. Mm. Um, and I think that's where we're going with chocolate, but it's taking much longer than it is in some other sectors. Yeah. Angus, are there any things we should, are there any pointers that we might but, you know, for example, the, the certifications, mm. do they mean anything? Rainforest Alliance, Fair Trade, Organic, are they... Because these didn't have them, and you're saying that you know that two of these producers are pretty good. So... Yeah, I think, I mean, organic really means something. Um, and, and, you know, Fair Trade and Rainforest Alliance are a, a, a kind of minimum standard, and it's, um, you know, quite often one size fits all for different geographies, different agricultural um, types. But, you know, they're way better than nothing. I mean, they're, they're, they're um, things, to be, things to be supported. Um, but from a, from a consumer's point of view, I think if, uh, you know, if people are in the habit of buying chocolate in a kind of promiscuous way, of just sort of grabbing at things and expecting to know everything about a brand in about two seconds, it's, it's, it's just impossible. So I think we've got to be realistic here, that if you're claiming to be a conscious consumer, then please take the time to investigate brands. You know, they, there are websites, there are questions to ask, but the chocolate makers have to, first of all, promise something delicious. That's the gateway into getting anybody's attention in the chocolate world. And then the second thing which should underpin that is, by the way, we're a good brand and we're doing all the stuff you'd expect us to be doing um, and getting stronger at it every year. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's any shortcuts. You know, mm -hmm. we, if, we want, if we want the chocolate industry to improve and we want to bring about a revolution, then all of us consumers have to put the legwork in, which is to, you know, to, to decide which brands we're going to uh, you know, investigate and find out if they pass the sniff test or not. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if yes, go ahead and buy them and enjoy them. If not, keep looking. I mean, our, our hero and mentor, um, Nick and I, Mott Green, was really into organic because that was all about making sure that the land was protected, the ecosystems were protected. It's very, very strict what you have to go through in order to get that thing. And it's expensive. But he didn't have any time at all for fair trade because he said it was a gravy train. They have fancy offices in San Francisco people, you know, lolling around in their air-conditioned cars and everything else, and they're, you know, they're being paid by these effectively small people to get that certification. Mm. So that, I think, there is quite a bit of greenwashing mm. on that. And it, you know, it's a stamp which a lot of people will think, if they see that on it, that must be a good chocolate. Mm. But I think it's really hard to show 
how much the farmers benefit from that. Mm. There, there may be some very small incremental things which happen. Um, it could be a clinic gets built or a school, which is good for the, all the community, and I think that's great. But I think it's, it's not really what they're saying it is. It's not making huge differences mm. to, to the lives of those farmers. Nick, what do you think? Are there, are, there, are there indicators consumers can look out for? I'm also thinking about price ingredients does that in, does that give a an indication as to how ethical a chocolate bar might be i mean you do have to pay people more uh that is it, it go onto the website as angus said right there is information instagram is full of information i don't know the team from chocolada but i know we're in falmouth I know that they have a cool sort of Bath Sirocco roasting machine from like the 1900s. You, you know, there's information out there for chocolate nerds if you want to look. And that sort of gives you an indication, especially when you see they're shipping cacao from Trinidad over. Those personal relationships make it very difficult to rip people off, number one. Okay, so when you see sort of a big company where there's no connection, it gives you a few red flags that something is amiss. Um, the same thing with Fire Tree. You know, I know that they source their cacao from areas which are volcanic. You know, it's kind of given away with the name. All of those little things you can find online. But you're right, it's made me really think about what I do to be able to connect with the people who are going to buy my chocolates. My chocolate is kind of quite, I'm, frankly speaking, it's, it's very, you know, minimalist. And, and I like it. I like that style. But how well am I getting across to the consumers that, we're trying to do more. And it's very difficult when you're a small company, as a lot of craft chocolate companies are, to be able to build, to be able to scale. You know, you don't have the money to be able to put into flash packaging, but maybe we need to think about that. But do you do flash packaging or making sure that you're, the farmers who you're working with are paid fairly? It's a hard one, right? It's For me, I, I, it's a real challenge. I've gone with paying more and dealing with more basic packaging, you know? I don't know where that's going to get me, but hopefully I'll still be able to build. Mm. Another question to the panel. Is it possible to produce ethical chocolate on an industrial mass-produced scale? Is that like an oxymoron in itself? Or is it actually... I'm thinking like the Cadbury's Kit Kats, but ethical... Mm. Is that is that even possible, or do we always ha will we always be in a situation where we have to do our research, source the smaller micro producers? Angus, happy to lead off. <clears throat> I think um, it's only possible if if the um, the money's there, and um, at any analysis would would tell you that well, actually the money is there when you look at the the profits that are available from either um, making small amounts of chocolate and charging a super premium price or making shed loads of chocolate that's quite cheap, but actually if you look at the profits of some of the long established multinationals, there's plenty of profit there. So it's you've got to believe it is possible. And um, the, the way it's going to be possible is through unleashing consumer power and when consumers um, prioritise uh, that in the choice of their brands, then it, it will come to pass because that, that's what everybody runs a business on. Um, so it feels like the power really is in our hands, the consumer, uh, well, how much pressure isn't. we put on chocolate producers and how much we make it clear that there are a certain set of ethical standards we expect. The, the scale per se is not the the blocker to right. actually behaving ethically. Um, you know, so Ghana, which, which I, I've come to know quite a bit about, the the way it's run by the Ghana Cocoa Board is is very professional. Um, all the all the beans will be bought from every farmer who wants to sell them. So that's kind of the best thing about the Ghana Cocoa Board. The farmers don't have to worry about finding a market. And by the way, that's one of the problem. One of the problems that can occur with craft chocolate makers, they tend to spread their favours around. You know, buying buying beans from one part of the world and then trying some beans from somewhere else and somewhere else, and that's 
not that useful if you're a farmer because what you want is a long-term relationship. You want to know that you can depend on that buyer and you can, you can invest in your business knowing that you, you know, you've got a, de a dependable and reliable buyer. So the Ghana Cocoa Board operates at scale. It's very professional. Um, and if the, if the price is made right, right, then the conditions begin for it to be ethical. Mm. But there's you know, problems of deforestation, which, again, which is pretty rare in, in any type of crop. Cocoa actually loves to, be gr loves to grow alongside other trees and other um, types of plants. So biodiversity is not a problem for the cocoa tree in terms of yield. It, it can coexist and, you know, with other trees, which for the chocolate industry is an amazing opportunity that can help combat climate change and can help bring biodiversity back. Um, that's not possible for lots of other food crops, but it is possible for, for us in the chocolate industry. We need to, to grab that and, and, and connect it with paying the right price, which then rolls out an ethical behavior, and that kind of price is there for us to, is to work towards and become a, you know, a, an industry that we can all be really proud of. Mm. Chantal, what do you think? Well, I think one of the really interesting things we haven't spoken about at all is sugar and chocolate and the, the recipes and what people enjoy eating. And I think we know there's an absolute epidemic of obesity all around the world. Um, and I think if we can get have a better relationship with chocolate and learn how to enjoy darker chocolate, what, what I found, you know, from growing up as a child who, who could never get enough chocolate because... <laughs> There were too many children in my family. Um, you know, I would just inhale it. And now I have the privilege of being able to work with some of the best chocolate in the world. And it's, you know, I have a security blanket, usually, you know, quite a lot of it around. I tend not to eat very much, but when I do, I'm really enjoying it. And I think when you have a really, really good piece of chocolate, a bit like wine, again, that you will savour it much more if the quality is there. And I think if people can change the way they relate to the chocolate, then they might see it's actually worth spending more and eating less, and they will get every benefit on every level through to their own health and get all the one wonderful micronutrients that come from this fermented food that's a fruit and you know can be vegan and all those things. So I think really good quality chocolate has so much going for it, mm -hmm. um, and we you know we shouldn't beat ourselves up about it too much. You can you can make really good choices as a consumer. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a, there's a whole thing in itself, being more mindful about what we consume in terms of where we spend our money and actual, the actual consumption of food as well. Nick, what do you think? Do you think there could be... Do you think it's possible to have a huge brand that's mass-producing chocolate that could actually be ethical? Or is it just a pipe dream? I don't know the intricacies of their business, but there is a company which Chantal um, made reference to in terms of producing great curvature, uh, melting chocolate earlier on. Um, they produce great chocolate. They, it's used by chefs all over the world. And from my experience of seeing how they operate in this country, how they source their cacao here or in the Dominican Republic, they're able to be a small big chocolate company i mean like i think they have profits of nearly a billion or something like that it's big right but that's tiny in comparison to a lot of the big chocolate companies that's possible but they have a market who appreciate and are willing to pay that a little bit more you know they have the top chefs who are willing to pay that money for the product you know people when they buy their bars to eat are paying significantly more but they have a market at the moment, we need, as you say, ethical consumers. We need people to be able to vote with their pounds. Uh, and until we get that, there's never going to be a change because ultimately these are huge. And co companies, when we talk about the chocolate companies, they have been around for such a long time. I mean, like literally like <laughs> over 100 years, 120, 130 years, and we're trying to challenge them. They, they are ahead of us in terms of market penetration. They're ahead of us in terms of technology. They're ahead of us in terms of hiring some of the best best brains within science to be able to give them that competitive advantage. 
we've got a long way to go, but we need the support of the consumer to be able to get us where we need to be. Okay. I think that's a key kind of point for everyone here and tuning in to, to, to take, because I probably didn't acknowledge that quite enough about the power of the consumer to make sure our voices are heard in terms of what we are looking for when, we're, when we want to buy chocolate. Now, I'm conscious of the time, and I want to make sure that there's time for people to ask questions, but I also want to make sure that everybody knows exactly about the samples that, reminder number two, you will be picking up at the end of the event. And incredibly, all three of the panelists have provided some sample chocolate samples for everyone to take home. So uh, I think it would be good to know what it is that we've got. Um, Nick, can we start with you? You, you? These came from Jamaica, is that right? Yes, yes. These, Fortunately, this, this I, I, was, I was able to, to come over recently and, and have a wonderful visit with my mum, which was great after two and a half years. Um, oh. And I brought some chocolate and I had samples which I brought over. So that is, uh, our Blue Mountain bar, so it's a 71% and it has Jamaican Blue Mountain, uh, Jamaican. I mean, Blue Angus Ma is just diving right in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No one else has, uh, has, has a sample, so you'll go, you'll be able to pick them up. Sorry, sorry, Nick, carry on, Blue Angus. Mountain. Slow, slow your roll, Angus. Uh, Blue Mountain coffee is one of the best in the world and it's just a really nice combination to be able to put into a chocolate. Oh, God. And so, would you recommend we have this with the enjoy with a coffee because that, that is quite how i like to enjoy chocolate actually sometimes with coffee listen it's like denim on denim i'm never going to tell anybody <laughs> <laughs> also what grows together goes together right i love that yeah absolutely yeah absolutely. okay <laughs> i stole that from somewhere else um <laughs> Chantel, what well i mean god i mean Chantel's giving uh we've nice got three tea. that um the first one number one on the label is the grenada 71%. This actually did come, again, in a sailboat, oh, um, wow. in blocks. So it was made 100% manufactured in Grenada, but melted down and turned into very thin pieces, which wouldn't survive for two seconds in the tropics, but is a really nice, thin, snappy chocolate. That's organic, but it's um, when we sell it like that, we can't call it organic. Okay. Then we have um, a second one, which is... A very dear friend of mine called Susana Cardenas from Ecuador. She's doing work with heritage cacao plants, the trees, and it's got a very, very different... I mean, the Grenada is very robust and fruity and all sorts of notes from sort of plum to leather and hay and, wow. you know, all sorts of things. This one is very, very dramatically tropical fruit. So it's pineapple and coconut and banana, but that's this particular flavour profile. It's really quite delicate. And they're both 70%, but they're very, very different. And I think people who are challenged by dark chocolate usually love this one because okay. it's very gentle. Um, and then the last one, number three, is a salted caramel mini egg um, made in France from Ecuadorian beans. Um, so it's, it's made on a... A bigger scale than I can make them, but they I think they're a good maker and it's something to keep for Easter Sunday. Oh my god, that's so <laughs> sweet. This is my first Easter egg of the of the year. That's great. And Angus, we also have a lovely package from you. Look at this. Tell us what we've got. Um yes, so we we've got uh, two two oh, different chocolates. Two. We have um a um a, what we call a baton, it's like a, a long, thin uh, piece of chocolate. The beans uh, were grown on our own organic cocoa farm in, in the Caribbean. I know some members of the audience have already, have already been and inspected them. The, um, the, um, the recipe we've gone for is 70%, uh, so it's not kind of too, too intense. The flavour notes um, of... I mean, the, the soil is very volcanic in, in this part of St Lucia. It's the southwest. There's this huge, you know, huge volcanic... Um, recent activity, the soil is, you know, very, uh, very special, and the flavour of the cacao is sort of brooding. It's it's definitely got a kind of hint of um, something, you know, very kind of dark and powerful about it. Uh, 
yellow fruits come through in, a, in a quite a subtle way, and something else that's like a, a kind of a whiskey, kind of malt whiskey kind of edge. So not, not a shrinking violet of a <laughs> cocoa bean by any means. And then we also have a, um, a portion of um, a drinking chocolate. So this is something that you can, you can make at home. It's totally unsweetened, so it's 100% cacao beans. These ones are from Honduras. They're a particular type of uh, cacao called Mayan red. Um, and it, the, the red does come through in the red, red fruits. It's got a hint of spice about it. And literally, there's no sugar at all, so it's, it's pretty hardcore. Um, so when, you, when you're making it, you can, you can you know, experiment and see. You can make it with water if you're super hardcore. Or if you make it with milk, the lactose brings a certain element of sweetness and helps round it. But just play around and experiment with it. Um, and yeah, you've, you've got two very different beans there. Well, I mean, how lucky are we? And I feel like that <laughs> has uh, made the ticket price worth it alone, <laughs> if we're honest. Um, massive thank you to all three of you for those samples. I would now like to take some questions from the audience. And I've also got an iPad here um, okay, for online questions too. So let's just first get a show of hands so I can get a microphone over to somebody. OK, this lady in the pink scarf at the front, please. But while someone with the microphone is getting over, would you like to raise your hand again? Sorry, that's it. OK, let's have a look. Right, um, I'm going to go with just number three, Karen Smith. So question for the panel. What is the difference between roasted and unroasted as some craft chocolate makers make unroasted bars? Oh, nice one. So that's the mm. raw cacao, which is definitely a thing in certain um, circles. Personally... So, so where they've made... They oh. don't ferment. They effectively are not fermented beans. So then it's not chocolate, is it? Well, it's quite a good area of debate. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Personally, I'm not yeah, leaving, but we I, could just stay for another <laughs> hour and chat. I, I think that it's a, an essential part of the flavour profile of bean to ferment it. Um, and I think most processing the temperature needs to be raised a certain amount to make the beans safe as well, um, and the roasting as well. So there's, a, there's quite a complex thing about the um, sort of the microbial activities and things as well. So when we see unroasted and roasted, it's to do with whether it's been fermented. Well, there are many. There, it's just a, it's rather a different process which has okay. followed. I think Nick maybe has something to say about that. Yeah, I mean, um, I it's it's about how much you how you like your chocolate, but um, the sort of raw in terms of unfermented is going to be a very different flavour experience to if you have a chocolate which has been fermented and you've really brought out those chocolate notes. That's how we've traditionally done it. I mean, some people say that um, the unroasted chocolate um, has a you know, again, a different flavor to it. Um, but there's a whole chemical reactions, Maillard reaction in terms of how you're bringing out flavors within the chocolate, which are lost when your chocolate is unroasted. Uh, and there's also the kill steps. You know, E. coli is a real thing, people. Okay, and so basically putting in place things like roasting chocolate is a good way of making sure that your chocolate mm -hmm. is safe, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but they will put in different kill steps themselves they may steam their chocolate not taking it above a temperature where it would be classed as being roasted uh but you know for me personally i like chocolate roasted it just for me all of that's what it's all about that's where the flavor is for me um what about you angus i think um well if you if you imagine um you know a farm setting when when the the beans have come out of the wild fermentation by the way so unlike the way wine is made, where the winemaker imposes a, a, a yeast culture into, into the grapes to control the fermentation. The way most of the world's cocoa is grown is entirely wild fermentation. So whatever is floating by in the breeze in terms of yeasts 
activates um, the, the, the sugars and kickstarts the fermentation. So chocolate is a wild fermented product, which we don't make enough of. Um, but once the beans have come out of the fermentation boxes, they're really sticky and they've gone kind of brown and they need to be dried and they're typically put out on racks. And, you know, this is, we're talking about farms here. We're talking about next to, you know, the, the rainforest in a lot of cases. And we're, we're talking about the tropics where there's more biodiversity and flora and fauna than anywhere else on the planet. So overnight, there's all sorts of things scurrying around. And believe me, when you know that, you'd like your beans roasted. <laughs> <laughs> because there's an important kill point where the temperature goes that just kills all the bacteria that may be there, as well as developing these amazing flavour notes. OK, so raw cacao nibs. So that's not... It's not ro toasted, toasted. Um, I think there's a difference between um, unfermented cacao or um, cacao that's been fermented and then you choose whether it's been roasted or not, which okay. I think is actually poten potentially the question. OK. So yeah. if we just assume that everything's been fermented, then the choice is, yeah, if you don't have it roasted, then the flavours are more stringent and you risk the, you run the risk of potentially being in hospital for a long stay. Now I was thinking um, raw cacao nibs was a health food. Well, <laughs> Might put there, me there, there, there is a way of pasteurising them, but okay. it's, yeah, anyway. That's I'm, I'm, interesting. You I can see we're all old school on it. Yeah. I, I think also, I might be wrong on this, but I, I'll ask Nick, is there any wild animal that will eat the raw bean? Not in its entirety, but like rats are our biggest issue. But they're eating the fruit, aren't they? So they're eating the fruit, so they'll get into the fruit. But, you know, there have been people who have, like, taken a, you know, a freshly opened, eaten pod and thrown it into the ferment, you know? Especially when you're put paying people not very much money. People mm. will do that. Interesting. It's like, because remember, they've been paid by the weight. So they yeah. don't care what goes in there. So, like, you know, you'll find, like, bullet casings, you'll find, like, bits of string, you'll find coffee beans, stones. E everything makes it in. Um, but when you pay people decently, they tend to give you quality. Mm. <coughs> um, back to this question over here, please. Hello. Hello. Um, thank you. You have answered my question. <laughs> ah. <laughs> <laughs> Was it this question? Exactly oh, that. my gosh. <laughs> isn't that a coincidence? And what, what do you think about um, raw cacao? Um, I haven't had very much of it. Um, but I know people who are very keen on it. So I, I, I really what I wanted to know was what the difference in production was and, um, and what the issues were. And you've answered everything. So and That's handy. Two for one. That was good. Um, there was, OK, a lady up here in the leopard print. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I'm Dana. I'm, I'm a food policy student. I'm writing an essay on cocoa at the moment, so this is such good timing. Ooh. I can also answer the value chain bit. So it's 6% farmer, 7.6% processor, 33% manufacturer, and 44% retailer. So good. That's, that's the difference. Work. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about um, commod commodification of cocoa and about the um, world cocoa price. So. 70% of cocoa comes from um, the Ivory Coast and Ghana, and that's all linked to the futures market. Um, and that, in effect, means that the big manufacturers can say that they don't really have anything to do with the cocoa price, because mm. they can say that that's determined by the world, um, by, by the futures market, which means that they can put their hands up and say, that's nothing to do with me, which means that they can really quite easily say, we don't really have to change our price because it's determined by the futures market, which means it's very easy for them to be hands off and say, we don't have to change our price. Um, so I wondered what more you could say about the global solutions to the farmer income problem. Because at the moment, the research indicates that 75% of consumers believe that um, chocolate companies already act ethically. So when you have that on one side and manufacturers saying, cocoa price has nothing to do with us. It does feel a little bit damning in terms of what the future is for farmer income. Sorry if that's a bit depressing. <laughs> no, well, it's fantastic. We've yeah. got chapter and verse here, you, except you didn't tell us about the VAT. 
um, but I think probably Angus might be um, a good person to answer that question. But I mean, I would say just simply is if we could have a more direct relationship with the growers and cut out the commodity market. For me, that's that's the easy answer. But I know life is not as simple as that. Yeah, and I, I think the um, the way to try and make sense of it is to think of the kind of multiple steps that are taken from the farm gate right to um, you know you getting your chocolate product back at home and the exchanges that have to happen the value exchanges all the way to you know to give everybody their cut along the way the the way to do the right thing is to as, as, as a chocolate maker is to have a relationship with the, the farmer directly and um, that means that you are disintermediating the 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 futures, the, the market, you're not buying from the market, you're buying from real people, and you know, that's, that's a direct relationship. So um, I, I think the, you know, the fact that uh, cacao can be a speculated commodity is, is absolutely terrible. I mean, we're talking about people's livelihoods here. But the, the, the way that it works in Ghana is that the Ghana Cocoa Board buys at price X, and then it sells into the global um, commodity market at price Y. And the difference funds about 20% of the Ghana um, exchequer. So the roads, the hospitals are paid for, if you like, off the back of the cocoa farmers. And that's the way that the Ghanaians have chosen to structure their society in the way you know, they want to do it. The, the recourse for a brand like Hota Chocolat is to say, OK, we, you know, we respect what you've done. There are good things about that structure in terms of efficiency and being a guaranteed buyer. The way to make it right for us is to say, OK, well, we'll just pay extra direct to the farmer then. And the Ghana Cocoa Board has no problem with that. And you know, we had meetings with them and checked it. And they said, no, if you want to do that, that's fine. And we'd encourage you. It's, it's, there's nothing you know, um, that we have against that at all. If you want to top up, go ahead. And you make the difference, right? Well, that's the thing. So we're, we're hoping that people will, um, will follow. I mean, we're, we're in a lucky position because we um, have a direct relationship with our customers. So we can, we can explain what we're doing and we can help build support. It's a bit different when there's a huge supermarket in the middle and you're you know, perhaps dealing with the chocolate buyer who says they're going to delist you because you're, you know, you're trying to do something different, potentially. But the thing to cut through it is consumer power, because everybody listens to the consumer, the big supermarkets, the big multinational chocolate brands, everybody. So if we can make our program work, which we only started in, in this stepped up way in, in September, having spent 15 years learning all about cocoa growing in, in St. Lucia, um, then we'll be able to Know, transparently report on it, and it's there for any anybody to to, to follow, and we'll 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 share information um, really openly and be as supportive as we can. I think there's a piece about technology as well, which Blockchain. some other industries like um, rose growers and coffee people around the world often are using mobile technology to get prices and to make connections directly into markets. And this seems to be, again, cocoa farmers um, don't appear to be engaging with that. But I think that that could be something It, it is looking promising. In, in, in Ghana, more than, I'm pretty sure more than 50% of our farmers um, are getting their, their premium payments at the end of the season directly um, onto their mobile phones in their bank accounts. So it's... Um, it, it is beginning, and I think with blockchain as well mm. coming as well, that chain of custody can be even tighter. And, and I think you know, there's a real revolution as a possibility, which is that if people really, really want to get involved, they could try and actually make a connection. I mean, for example, Grenada Chocolate Company, sorry, I keep mentioning it, but they, through the pandemic, had a pretty dreadful time and the the final straw is that the little building where they were making their chocolate has been um, taken back by the landlord because he wanted to live in it which is fine it's absolutely it was his family house I don't think he was expecting it to be a, a chocolate factory for 20 years mm. 
and there had always been a vision to build something which was more of a purpose-built building. But that is an actual project that people could invest in. Hmm. So it's just how to make that business model where someone can say, I care this much about my chocolate and I'm actually prepared to back it properly and then I will know that all the chocolate I get has come from this particular source and all of these things have been done and really you can tick those boxes mm -hmm. and eat something delicious at the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say there's time for one more question. Ooh, they've all come up now, goodness. Um, okay, there's a mic over here, so <coughs> let's go right at the back, please, yeah. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, a company like Cadbury's has been called out for its connections to slavery as far back as of 1901, after the abolition of slavery. They've been called out for buying cocoa beans, knowing full well that slavery has been a part of the process, even though they were so closely connected to their Quaker roots. And accepting that, of course, there is a lot that consumers can do. There's power behind every purchase that we make. But when you look at a company like Cadbury's and think about the amount of money that they're making and how long it would take for us to convince them that they really need to change, should there be something happening at a government level? Or just is there something else that consumers can be doing aside from buying good chocolate to show that we want more to be done to reform the industry? Mm -hmm. Nick, did you... Yeah. What are your thoughts uh, on that? Yeah, I, it, it's tricky. Some people say that we should be taking more direct action, like not buying from these companies, but the impact, as Angus was saying, can you imagine just removing 20% of, you know, the, you know, foreign exchange from the country? I mean, it would be devastating. It's interesting, earlier on we spoke about Chocolada, they're based in Cornwall. When I lived in Cornwall, when I lived in Falmouth, I remember that a lot of people in that community never, never had sugar with their tea or coffee. And it's because it was literally, uh, it was like a hangover of the moral stance the communities took during the period where, you know, sugar was obviously linked to slavery. And, and I think that we need to think of more direct action ways to be able to try and elicit change uh, for us to be able to move things on. Um, because, you know, I often joke that the longer I stay in chocolate, the more I'm moving towards being a Marxist. Uh, because things are, just, <laughs> things are just so unfair with the way the system is based. Um, and it just changes, it just changes your view on, on the model, um, you know. Uh, so I would love to see us take the argument to the governmental level. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the people of the wallets have a lot of power. You know, they're able to lobby, they're able to give reasons why there shouldn't be change. Um, again, I think it's up to us to hold them accountable. Mm. I'm, uh, I think we should end it on that point because I just cannot be the person between you all and your chocolate tastings anymore <laughs> and feel the mounting pressure. Um, what an absolute pleasure and thoroughly interesting chat with the three of you um, I'm sure everyone else would echo those thoughts thank you so much it was it was really enlightening Nick it's such a shame that you're not here but now the uh, Angus and Chantal will be outside um, feel free to chat with them a little bit longer if you're able to stay around and if you didn't get your question answered um, and it's been a pleasure Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy your chocolates. Oh, thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Playing with your food. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid stand mixer and attachments.